Okay, well, thank you for joining me. I'm Oscar Fernandez. I'm a professor at Wellesley College just outside of Boston. Um, I'd like to talk to you about unit four in the AP Calculus course, specifically real world applications of derivatives. And there's a few things that I wanna co uh, cover in this lecture, and here's a quick little overview. So these are all meant to be applications of differentiation of the rules of derivatives, the interpretations of derivatives. Um, the first thing we'll talk about is student loans. Second thing is maximum heart rate. Third, we'll talk about the speed of sound, specifically how it varies with the ambient temperature. Uh, the fourth is the constriction of the throat during a cough. This may not sound very exciting, uh, I realize, but we'll see then that this is a fantastic window into how your body um, uses maximization principles to help keep you healthy. And the last thing we'll talk about, save the best for last, is the age of the universe. So let's start off with the first application to student loans. Suppose a student takes out a $1,200 amortized student loan. So what does that amortized word mean? Let me just go there really quickly. So this effectively means that the loan is accruing interest. And when you start making monthly payments, you're paying a portion of the original loan amount plus a portion of the interest. Um, so suppose a student takes out an amortized student loan with an interest rate of R percent. And you know, we're gonna express this in a decimal, maybe like 0.04 or 4%. Uh, and the term here is a 10 year term for the loan. We are gonna say that M of R is the monthly payments where R is the interest rate in decimal form. So the first thing I wanna talk about is how would you interpret this statement? This is not a calculus statement just yet, but it's meant to be an introduction to connecting what you've learned in the calculus class to uh, these real world applications. So the idea is how to interpret this in real world terms. And what we mean by this really is how would you explain what all this you know, notation and um, functional uh, 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 values mean to somebody who doesn't really spend a lot of time in an AP calculus class. So what would you say? Well, the first thing I'm gonna point out here is that the left-hand side is the value of the function m of r when r equals 0.05, okay? So this part is the monthly payment of the loan at an interest rate of 5%, right? So that 0.05 in here is the r% percent written in decimal form, okay? So then this second part, you know, equals $122.21. So that would tell us that the monthly payment um, is $122.21. So again, just as an introduction to how you would start interpreting and connecting these concepts, this is the first thing I wanted to, um, to mention. And what I'm gonna do throughout this presentation, actually, you see me writing in red in the on the slides. On the next slide, I've duplicated these to actually put in the typed up version of all of these solutions. That way we can read through them together and talk a little bit more about them if there's anything that I've missed that I, that I forgot in uh, writing the solution. Um, so here's a more polished version of this interpretation. When the loan's interest rate is 5%, again, that comes from here, the monthly payment is $122.21. Great, so no calculus set, but here comes the calculus. So let's talk a little bit about uh, M prime of R. And specifically, I just wanna ask about the units. So this gives me a great opportunity to review a little bit of the relationships that you have learned uh, about derivatives in your AP Calculus class. So specifically, I'm gonna go with Leibniz notation and its relation with Newtonian notation. So remember that in Leibniz notation, the derivative F prime of X, or in this case, y, uh, M prime of R, is written as dm dr in this case. That's really useful because for me, it helps me remember what the units of the derivative are because the units of M in this problem are dollars. So that's the units of the numerator, if you will. If you remember when you're calculating the derivative using the limit definition, you take a difference of the Y values. So here in the numerator, we're effectively taking a difference of dollar amounts. And then the denominator units, we're just gonna call these units percent, which is a sort of a, a funny unit to think about, but you'll see why in a minute once we do a, another example here. Um, so in Leibniz notation, it helps to, to remember that the units of the derivative is the quotient of the units of the y uh, function with the units of the independent variable x. 
So in this case, we're gonna put this together and say units of M prime of R are dollars per percent. And again, we'll see how these you know, strange looking units play out in the next uh, question I'll ask. So here's my admittedly very short, but slightly more polished um, solution in a written form. Great, so here's where we're really gonna start getting into the calculus. Um, how do we interpret this fact? So if you, in fact, take out a $1,200 amortized student loan at an interest rate of, and this is part of the interpretation here, 4%, and you work out, you know, you assume it's a 10-year term, and you work out what the monthly payments would be, you get some number. Now, in a real world environment, like the environment we live in, interest rates change all the time. So right before you take out the loan, the interest rate might be 4%. But maybe you're not sure if you need the loan or not. Maybe you have enough to cover the expenses it's gonna pay. So you wait a few days and the interest rates change slightly. So again, change is at the core of what derivatives help you understand. So in this case, suppose that the derivative at 0 0.04 equals 55.5 dollars per percent. What does that mean in real world terms? How do you interpret that? Um, so again, I'm going to go back to Leibniz notation here to extract and, and remind you what you probably have already learned about how to interpret this. And I'll say there are many different ways to do this, and I'm going to show you one of them that I think is very useful. Um, so when uh, the change in R is small, right? If you remember, dm is sort of the infinitesimal change in m, and dr is the infinitesimal change in r. These are as tiny as you can imagine, but not zero changes, uh, intuitively speaking. So when delta r is small, when the change in r is very small, this infinitesimal change is about this actually calculable change, delta m. Same thing with dr. This infinitesimal change is about delta r. Okay? So what we learn from here is that the derivative is approximately the average rate of change. And again, this is something you probably learned uh, very uh, early on in your study of derivatives. So if I multiply here by delta R, then I get a really useful way to interpret derivatives. And this is something that I'm gonna come back to over and over again in this presentation, because we'll use it in so many different real world contexts. Um, so in English, what does this mean? This means that, well, if I apply it to this particular setting, then what is my interpretation? So the change in M is approximately the value of the derivative. So in this case, that's 55.5 times delta R. Okay, so how do I interpret this statement in English? Um, rather than write it out on the next slide, I, I actually type it out. So I'll just say it in English and then we'll talk about it on the next slide. This uh, interpretation would say, if the interest rate changes by delta R, again, we're assuming that the current interest rate is 4%. So if it changes by delta R from 4%, then the monthly payment would change by approximately 55.5 times that delta R. Okay, so that's, that's a really nice interpretation. And again, we assume that delta R was small. So if you take out a 4% loan and you, know, you wake up the following morning and the interest rates are 25%, you know, that, that's not a, a small change. So we would not expect this approximation to be very accurate in that setting. So I'm gonna flip through here and, and show you the polished version. So how do I, would I interpret this statement in real world terms? So this is what, what I would say. When the, inter when the loan's interest rate is 4%, so that's again coming from this value of R, a small change, so here's that qualifier, delta R in that rate will result in a change of approximately. You know, it is likely not a linear change. If it were, then this would, a word approximately would not be there. Approximately 55.5 delta R in the monthly payment. So that is fine, but it might be a bit too abstract. So here is a way to understand that through a nice example. So what if uh, you delay taking out your loan by you know, a few days, and in that time period, the interest rates rose a little bit to 4.1%. The delta R in this case is 0.1%, uh, okay? Um, so what would happen there? So delta R is 0.1%. Uh, 
So in decimal form, this is a 0 0.01, so you divide by 100. Uh, and then you would take that R value and you would multiply it by delta R. And this is one thing that, that professors do all the time, they make silly mistakes. Uh, so I made a silly mistake here in getting this number 5.55. So if I take 55.5 multiplied by 0 0.001, I'm moving the decimal, decimal place over um, two times, dividing by 100. Um, so one, two, and then um, uh, I get uh, 0 0.55555. Okay. Um, excuse me, 0 0.0555. Okay, so I'm moving it over uh, from 1, 10, 100, 1,000, so three places. Okay, so ignore this number here and let's replace it with 0 0.0555. All right, so what's the takeaway? Takeaway is that if the interest rate increases by a little bit, then this is a positive number. Your monthly payment is going to increase by a little bit. And that makes sense. If you take a loan out with a higher interest rate than you know, it was a few days ago, you should expect your monthly payment to be the same, uh, to, to, to be a little higher, assuming that all the other parameters for the loan are the same, the term, the, uh, the amount you're taking out. Okay, so we're gonna come back to, I'm gonna flip back, flip, flip back to this uh, slide four. Again, I mentioned this is gonna be a very useful interpretation for the derivative that we will use throughout the rest of these slides. Um, and that's the last thing I want to say about student loans, just to get started with interpreting the derivative uh, and remembering some of the notation about derivatives. Um, so this second application is especially neat if you are someone who goes to the gym or if you go out for a run. Um, this is something that uh, is really useful to keep in mind. This is about the maximum heart rate. So loosely speaking, that is the highest heart rate that can be sustained during prolonged exercise. So what, uh, how, do we, how do we model this, right? How do we uh, understand this mathematically? There are a few formulas out there. This is one that turns out to be fairly accurate across the board for adults. So this is the a model for the maximum heart rate for an adult of age A years. So R of A is 192 minus 0 0.007 A squared. R here is measured in beats per minute and then A is measured in years. So here's the first thing, right? We wanna calculate the derivative. We wanna include the units. And then you can kind of see that later on, we're gonna to wanna to interpret what does the derivative mean? Um, I'll mention one quick thing here. Notice that R of A is a quadratic function of A. It's downward, okay? So if we think about a very, very simple graph where this is A and this is R of A, right? When A equals zero, this entire term is zero. So we're at 192, you know, a person of age a zero a equals zero years is definitely not an adult, but nonetheless. Uh, and then this is a quadratic function that opens down. Okay, so there's some you know age here where this model predicts heart rate is zero. Again, so at these extremities, uh, this is what happens when you do mathematical modeling. The model breaks down. It it, it doesn't make sense. Wow. So this is why this is for an adult of age a year. So sometime between I don't know 15 or so years old to probably maybe like. 70 or 80, whatever the maximum age was in the study used to derive this model. Um, this is a fairly accurate model for your heart. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, the thing to point out here is that because it is a quadratic function that opens downward, uh, it predicts that your heart rate decreases with age. Right? So it's going down as you age. And that makes sense. Again, as you age, your heart is less able to pump the blood that's needed for your, the rest of, uh, of your body during exercise lowering the highest heart rate that you can achieve. Okay, so let's calculate the derivative of R of A. I'm gonna use um, a few derivative rules here. So I'm gonna run through this calculation just to illustrate some of the rules that you already know and have learned from your uh, class. So the first one is the derivative of a difference of two functions is the difference of the derivatives. Great, so that's one of the rules that you learned. Um, the second one is the derivative of a number is zero. Remember many ways to interpret that. A number, if you graph it, it's just a horizontal line. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Zero. And the derivative is the slope of the tangent, so zero. Another rule, the derivative of a number times a function is that number times the derivative of the function. Great. Uh, and then the derivative of a squared, this is a power function. So you might remember that the derivative of x to the n 
you bring down the power and then you subtract one. So if I bring down the two, I get two A, and then I subtract one from two and I get two A to the first. There we go. Um, so I multiply this out, I get minus 0 0.014A. All right, so that is my R prime of A derivative. And then remembering what we did in the first slide, talking about units, what are the units of this? Well, units of the derivative are gonna be the units of the uh, Y values, the, the dependent variable. In this case, that's R, so beats per minute, so BPM, divided by the units of the independent variable. In this case, that's A, and its units are years. So beats per minute per year. Yep. So the next slide is gonna give you all of that in the sort of nice and uh, written out form. Great, so again, how do we interpret this? What does this teach us about um, our maximum heart rate as we age, already knowing that the graph shows us that this decreases as we age? Okay, so let's interpret um, this statement. So we're gonna go back to the interpretation that we had discussed a few slides ago. And similarly, we're gonna say, well, we're talking here about an adult of age 20 years old, right? Um, and what's happening here? So we're talking about the derivative, right? So we're thinking about uh, the change in the beats per minute that this adult maximum heart rate is gonna experience as this person's age changes. And notice that in this case, it's negative, okay? So similarly to what we did in the few slides before, delta R is gonna be approximately the derivative, um, oops, sorry, uh, R prime of A, approximately the derivative times the change in the independent variable. Okay. So in this case, that's negative 0 0.28 times delta A. <clears throat> Excuse me, and again, let's talk about this in English first before we, we, we uh, write it out. Um, so this is gonna tell us that when the adult is 20 years old, if their age changes by a little bit, you know, we can't, we can't age in reverse. So if they age you know, an, another year or, or another half year, then their maximum heart rate changes by approximately this amount. Okay. So again, notice that it's negative. So that tells us that as we age, our maximum heart rate decreases by a little bit. And by how much? Approximately this product. So that's what's on the next slide. So when the adult is 20 years old, a small change, delta A in age, will result in a change of approximately negative this amount. So again, the example, uh, let's look at a 21 year old, let's look at the 20 year old, and let's uh, assume that that person ages a year. So delta A there is one. Then what would happen? I would take that one, I would multiply, uh, uh, substitute it in here, and I get minus 0 0.28. So the 21 year old's maximum heart rate is approximately 0.28 BPM lower, again, because of that negative sign, than what it was when they were 20 years old. So that would be a, a nice interpretation of the, um, coming from the derivative of this application of maximum heart rate. Okay, so let's talk a little bit less about uh, biology. We'll come back to that in a minute and let's talk about um, a little bit of physics. So let's think about sound. Uh, the speed of sound varies according to temperature, or the temperature of the surrounding air. So I think that's pretty cool, just as a statement. Um, a reasonable model for that temperature variance is this. Okay, so what's going on here? What are these uh, uh, functions? So let's, let's read on here. S of C is the speed, right, in meters per second of sound, and C is the ambient air temperature, okay, uh, measured in degrees Celsius. So this function is telling us, hey, uh, the speed of sound is not constant, right? It depends on the ambient temperature. One of the reasons for that is that sound is a pressure wave. So it is a um, change in pressure that, uh, is perceived through a lot of interrelated processes by our ears as sound, right? So it has to do with the movement of air. So it makes kind of sense that if the surrounding air is at a different temperature, it might affect how fast that sound um, is uh, traveling toward you. So what does this question say? Let's see if f denote the function converting temperature measured in Fahrenheit to Celsius, right? Uh, if you live in the United States, you're much more accustomed to Fahrenheit. If you live in Europe, you're probably much more accustomed to Celsius. And we can convert between the two. It's actually a linear function. So here's a question. What does the composite function measure? Okay, great. So let's think a little bit about that. Um, so if I were to think about evaluating, let's say I asked you, what is h of 10? Right? What would you do mathematically? You would um, put the 10 in over here. And then the first thing you would do is you would evaluate 
this function. And what is C of F? Well, C of F is the function converting temperature in Fahrenheit to Celsius. Uh -huh. So 10 is a Fahrenheit value. And then you put it into the function C of F and you get a Celsius value, okay? So converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. So you get a Celsius value. And then now I have that number and I calculate S of that number. Okay. So what does S of blah mean? Well, it's up here. So that takes a Celsius value and it returns the speed of sound. Great, so I think that this composite function measures the speed of sound uh, in terms of the temperature measured in Fahrenheit, you know, ambient air temperature measured in Fahrenheit. Um, so that's what I wrote here in this uh, type of form. Speed of sound is a function of the ambient air temperature measured in Fahrenheit. Okay, great. So what can we do with this, right? So let's start doing some derivatives. So suppose that C of 68 is 20, C prime of 68 is 5 ninths. Uh, calculate H prime of 68 and include the correct units. Um, and then of course we'll interpret that. So let's do that. Remember that H of F was S of C of F. Okay. Great. And if I want to take the derivative now, I have to review a little bit of the chain rule. So this is a composite function. The outside function is S, the inside function is C, and the independent variable here is F. So remember the chain rule says, take the derivative of the outside, evaluate it at the inside, multiply that by the derivative of the inside. So that's my chain rule step. And then from there, if I want to find H prime of 68, I'm going to substitute in the 68. Notice it's an F value, so I'll substitute that in everywhere I see an F. So that's C of 68 times C prime of 68. Great. And then I have a, a lot of information that they've given me that I can use, so that's nice. So uh, C of 68 is 20, so I can put that in there. And you can see what's happening here, just like what we discussed in the previous slide. Um, we're putting things where they go effectively. C prime of 68 is 5 ninths, so that's over here. Great, so the math now tells me that in order to calculate this derivative, I have to find this derivative, in, uh, substitute in 20, and then multiply by 5 ninths. So I'm gonna go back up here to the function, and I'm gonna calculate its derivative. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna rewrite it a little bit just to make sure that it is easier to work with once I start differentiating. So here is the rewritten form, great. And then I'm gonna go calculate S prime of C. So using some derivative rules again, the derivative of a number times a function is, the, is that number times the derivative of the function. And then here I needed a chain rule once again. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I, to differentiate this, I would bring down the one half and raise it to the minus one half. What did I do? So I differentiated effectively x to the one half, right? That is the outside function. We're taking the square root of something. So if I differentiate that, another power rule, I bring down the one half, it would be x to the minus one half, subtracting one from one half. And then because we're doing a chain rule, okay, so I did the derivative of the outside function, I'm gonna insert back the inside function and then multiply by the derivative of the inside. In this case though, the derivative of c plus 273.15 uh, with respect to c, it's just one. So I'm not gonna put that in there, okay? So then this one half multiplies with that 20.05 and gives us 10.025. And this uh, negative puts this quantity downstairs and the one half makes it a square root. So I get this as my derivative. <clears throat> Great, so I have my derivative. And then now all that's left to do is to substitute in 20 for C uh, and then put that quantity back in here and multiply it by five ninths and just do all the math, right? Uh, so I'm gonna forward to the slide where I've put in all the details. So here is that quantity numerically multiplied by five ninths and we get about 0 0.33 meters per second per degree Fahrenheit. Um, the units, right? So let's talk about the units real quick. Um, as we said before, the units of the derivative are the units of the output. In this case, H was, was a, a speed of sound, we had measured that in meters per second, divided by the units of the input, in this case, degrees Fahrenheit. So there we go, uh, meters per second per degrees Fahrenheit. Great, so we get a tiny number and it's positive. So can you think of how we might interpret that in this context? Well, let's, um, let's take a minute to, to talk about that real quick. So 
similar idea, right? The change in H, the speed of sound measured in degrees Fahrenheit, uh, is approximately the value of the derivative times the change in the independent variable. So based on this number, I would have a approximation of this one. So what does that tell you? That if the ambient air temperature gets a little hotter than you know, what it was in this problem, which was 68, then the speed of sound to increase by about 0 0.33 times that small change. So that's very interesting, right? So it tells you that the hotter the ambient air temperature is, the faster sound travels. So that's really cool. Okay, so again, these are all insights, right, that emerge from differentiation and from all the concepts you've been learning. And as we're seeing, it's the same mathematics all over uh, every slide, except we're applying it to vastly different contexts. And I'll, I'll mention um, something about that, how the, the ubiquity and the um, generality of mathematics at the end of this presentation. Okay, so let's talk about the fourth application. Um, this is the application I mentioned earlier, which uh, may not seem that exciting at first, but is really very interesting. So let's imagine your trachea as a cylindrical tube, which is you know, roughly, in a mathematician's um, uh, a view, roughly true. It's not a perfect cylinder, but we're going to model it as a cylinder with radius r. Great. So what happens when you cough? What happens when you cough is that actually your body tries to constrict the radius of your trachea. Why? Because it, or we'll find out in a minute, it wants to uh, expel air when you cough as fast as possible to try to dislodge whatever is in your throat if you have a cold, if you have mucus or something. Um, so this problem is going to help us walk through and understand how that works uh, from a calculus perspective. Great. So what are we doing here? So the velocity, velocity v, of air rushing through the trachea during a cough is well approximated by this function. And then this is the interval of interest. Uh, you know, the changes in your throat as you swallow, as you cough, are not that big. So r sub zero here is the original radius of the trachea. So we're going to approximate it. You know, it's well modeled by this function, the velocity of air rushing through your trachea. And we are going to consider only the uh, size up to the original size of your throat, and then half of it. So we're thinking of your throat getting smaller, again, because you're coughing, and, and you'll see that will expel air faster. And then k here is a constant that you can measure experimentally. Great, so what are we going to do here? So the first one is supposing that um, your original tracheal size is one centimeter. This is roughly the radius of a typical adult's trachea. Find the absolute maximum. Okay, so this is now a term that you have encountered in your optimization um, work in calculus. Great, so we're going to find the absolute maximum of a function, and we're given an interval. So the first thing I want to do is I want to put in here what we know about r sub zero. So r sub zero is one. And we then know a little bit about the interval over r that we're looking to maximize. Great, so I'll do a little bit of algebra here, and I'll multiply this r squared just to make the differentiation easier in a minute. And if you remember, if I want to find the absolute maximum, right? Uh, there's a nice little procedure for this, especially when I'm on an interval that includes the endpoints, right? So what I can do is I can find the derivative and find all the critical numbers, the points where the function's derivative is zero and unde or, or undefined. And then I look at those critical numbers and I look at the endpoints and I just look at the highest y value. And that will be the absolute maximum. So that's the procedure we're going to follow. So first thing we'll do is we will take the derivative here. Um, k is a number, so I'm just going to put it here. It goes along for the ride. Uh, and then here, this is a difference of two functions. The derivative will be the difference of the derivatives. And then applying the power rule here, I get 2r and 3r squared. Great. Uh, and then I'm going to factor out here an r, because uh, each term has an r, and I'm left with 2 minus 3r. Great. This is a function that is a quadratic function. You see the r squared here. Um, it's a polynomial, so there are no places where this function is undefined. Uh, there is a place where this function is zero. So if I set this equal to zero, I get two solutions, r equals zero, that comes from this part. And if I set this equal to zero, I get r equals two thirds. Okay. Now remember that we want to go back and only consider this interval. 
So we are going to reject this r equals zero case, even though mathematically we might want to look at it for an absolute maximum. For the interval of interest, which is a real world inspired interval, this is not uh, a critical number that we want to focus on. So this is our only critical number here, two thirds. And then I'm going to follow the procedure that I mentioned earlier. I'm going to evaluate the function v at its endpoints. And I'm going to evaluate the function v at this only critical number that I found. And I'm looking for the largest y value, and that will be the maximum. Um, the first thing to do here, v of 1, this is the easiest one to evaluate. Why? Because if I plug in 1 for r, I just get 0. So that's pretty simple. Great. Uh, if I plug in 1 half here, I'm looking at this one now. 1 minus a half is 1 half. So I get k times 1 half. And then there's also an r squared, so 1 half squared. Great. So I have 2 times 2 squared in the denominator, 2 cubed, so that's 8. So this is k over 8. This is 0 0.125k. All right. And now let's look at v of 2 thirds. So there I would have k times 1 minus 2 thirds. That's 1 third. Uh, and then I have 2 thirds cubed. Uh, sorry, 2 thirds squared from the r squared here. Great. So I have a 2 squared on the top. That's 4. And then I have, um, uh, let's see, I have uh, 3 squared is 9 times 3 is 27. Okay. Great, so then I'm left with figuring out which one of these um, is the, the largest, right? So how do I compare these two numbers? So I'm gonna go up here, and I'm gonna compare 1 eighth to um, 4 over 27, right? You might remember like one of the uh, uh, ways to compare these numbers you might have learned uh, a long time ago is to cross multiply and see which side is bigger, right? So if I do that, 27 times one is 27. This is one of these little tricks. Eight times four is 32. Okay, so this side has the higher multiple and, you know, we can talk about why this is a trick that works. What you're doing effectively is you're subtracting these two uh, uh, fractions and you're trying to figure out if it is the numerator positive or negative. Um, great, so we get 32 here. So this is the 4 over 27 that is a little bigger. So I'm going to put down here um, the result. Uh, I might have to check that math uh, just to make sure that they, that should be actually 4 over 27. Um, so this ends up being the maximum for uh, the, the, the critical number that yields the maximum uh, velocity, right? So what does that mean, right? How do we interpret that in the real world setting? So I want to go to that in the second slide, which is the main takeaway from this example. So experiments show that R is approximately two thirds R zero during a real world cough. That's interesting. Uh, interpret this R value in the context of your answer to part A. So what happens? Well. In part A, R sub zero was one. So experiments show that if R sub zero is one, two thirds is about the radius that your trachea contracts to in, uh, during a cough. And that's what we found in the previous um, part of this problem. So what does that mean? So I've written it down here in, type this up. During a real world cough, your throat contracts to a size that maximizes the velocity of expelled air. Um, so that's pretty cool. So again, you know, these maximization principles, this optimization theory that you're learning in calculus isn't necessarily an abstract thing. You could apply it to a random function or a random interval. But next time you cough, you can remember that what your body is doing is to try to maximize the airflow through your trachea. And you can think back to this problem and pull up this video and take a look at how we did that. So the last application I'll talk about is the age of the universe. This gives you again a sense of just how applicable, widely applicable math can be and specifically calculus. Uh, so what is this application? So first thing to notice is that when we look up at the stars, we're seeing ancient light that has taken a while to reach our eyes, right? And that is in and of itself an interesting thing. You know, if you are looking at a star uh, all the way over here, the light from this star uh, does not get to your eyes instantaneously. It takes some time to travel. It travels at the speed of light. Uh, and therefore, the further the, away from you the star is, the further back in time its light left and has now reached your eyes. So in this problem, we are going to use this basic fact to help us determine the age of the universe. Um, so what is the specific application? So the look back time measures how far back in time we're looking when we look at those stars. So we look at that time length. And you, you might imagine Ask yourself, how could we possibly measure this stuff? So this is, this is how astronomers do it. 
Um, turns out that when we look at distant objects in the universe, like faraway galaxies, light from those objects is redshifted by some amount z. Um, so redshift, a measure of the, the spectrum of light. You know, if you think of a, of a rainbow, um, Sometimes you can decompose light very easily into its, its spectrum. Uh, and astronomers decompose light from faraway galaxies into their spectrum to look at uh, how many different uh, uh, wavelengths of different lights are um, characteristic of that. And they can what's called a redshift. If, you know, I say roughly corresponds to how fast the object is receding from us. If the star or galaxy you're looking at is moving away from us, as a particular redshift pattern. Uh, and that's uh, codified by a parameter that's called Z, the redshift, which is positive. So a simplified formula for the look back time measured in billions of years associated with a redshift of amount Z is T of Z equals this quantity, where H is uh, a positive constant known as Hubble's constant. Great, so we are gonna use this uh, mathematical model of the look back time as a function of the redshift to help us figure out the age of the universe. So that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, so I put it up here. Um, first thing I wanna do is I wanna calculate the derivative and include its units, and then I'll, I'll get back to the age of the universe. Great, so what do I do? The first thing I will do here is multiply this constant, um, and that is gonna make my differentiation a little easier. Um, I'll do is take the derivative. So Similar to what we have done before, we'll talk about the derivative rules. The derivative of this, this is a number because h is a constant, so the derivative is zero. Um, the derivative here is going to be minus two over three h times the derivative of this function. So I'm gonna write this in a different form for the purposes of helping to differentiate it. So we're using the chain rule again on this part. And I'm gonna bring down the minus three halves and then I will subtract one from the exponent, we get minus five halves. And then the inside with respect to z is just one. So I'm not gonna uh, add that in there. And then here the twos cancel, so do the threes. And the negatives cancel, everything cancels. Um, and I'm left with one over h times one over one plus z to the five halves. Great, so that's my derivative. Again, you know, what does this mean? How does this help? You know, we'll, we will do that and talk about it in the next slide. Um, and then what are the units? Well, similar to what we talked about before, the units are, of the derivative are the units of the output. In this case, the look back time was in billions of years, divided by the units of the input. So this is where it gets interesting. Uh, the redshift is a dimensionless parameter. So it has no units, it has no dimensions. Um, so you can, you can, if you really want to put a unit in here, uh, you can say, per unit of redshift. You can use that as your unit. Um, but really it's a dimensionless um, parameter. This, that's why T is called the look back time. It really is a measure of time, in this case, billions of years. But anyway, we, we can easily put this as the units uh, if it makes, it makes it easier. Great, so what do I, um, so here's my, here's my written out form for that. So what do I use this for? Well, here's where we talk about the age of the universe. It turns out that in our current understanding of how the universe formed, we have this theory of the Big Bang, you might have heard of, that the, ex the universe began as a massive explosion of matter and energy billions of years ago. Um, how do we know that? One of the ways we know that is that when astronomers look up at the sky, they can detect a faint radiation signature. You know, if you, if you were to you know, uh, uh, use a firecracker and uh, explode a firecracker at, you know, at a safe distance, and then you waited a few minutes until uh, everything is done and you approach the firecracker, you would still notice the faint uh, evidence of an explosion of some form, maybe you know, smelling something or, or you would see some, some ash or something. Similar thing has happened and astronomers can see that across the, uh, the night sky. That's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Very, very faint radiation. But because this is pervasive, it's everywhere you look, no matter what angle you look at outside in the night sky, um, it gives us a way to think about this is like a remnant of the explosion initially that happened in the Big Bang. And it's a very, very distant thing. It's at the edge of the universe, quote unquote. So we can measure its redshift. So the redshift of this is about 1100 for a Z value, very large Z value. Um, so using this, we can actually substitute this in and find uh, 
calculate T of Z and get an estimate for the age of the universe. That ends up being about 13.8 billion years. Um, the thing is that the redshift estimate is not perfect, right? There is some margin of error and there are also new updates as NASA uh, develops better instrumentation to better measure this um, redshift. So the age of the universe has an error associated with it and also the redshift that is measured for the cosmic microwave background radiation has an error. So the, the question here is estimate how that age changes if the res measured redshift uh, changes by a small amount. And hopefully by now you can predict where I'm gonna go. So I'm gonna look at the change in T and say that it's approximately the derivative times the change in Z. And I'm not told what the change in the Z value, the redshift is, it's just delta Z. So I'm gonna leave that as is, but I do know what T prime of Z is, right? I calculated it to be this function up here. So this is a, a very mathematical answer, but we'll interpret that in a, in a minute in the next slide. This tells me that next time NASA launches a fancy satellite that uh, measures the redshift even more accurately, that is gonna change uh, by a little bit probably, right? The measured redshift amount of the cosmic microwave background radiation. And they will then go and update the age of the universe estimate. And when they do that, right, we can understand that process through exactly this little equation that fits on the slide, which is really fascinating. And the age of the universe will change by this very small amount. Whatever the current redshift value was, you put that in here, you calculate this quantity, the derivative, multiply it by that small change in the redshift value. Um, so I think it's just fascinating that we can, we can talk about these things uh, and, and um, model them uh, mathematically. Okay, so that's what I put in here in writing. So this quantity yields the approximate change in the age of the universe when, measured, when the measured redshift of the background radiation changes by a small amount of delta Z. Um, approximate change, right? So uh, current best estimates are 13.8 billion years. If the redshift is measured to be a little differently, then this quantity will tell us how much that changed. Maybe uh, it's found to be slightly older or slightly younger universe. Last thing I'll mention here is that this is another way to um, think about error, right? So what if I, for example, if you um, go on NASA's website, you will find that they um, you know, are very honest and say that even though this is the measured redshift value, there's a plus or minus error associated with it. Um, so you can use these same uh, analyses that we've been doing to understand errors. You can say, well, you know, if, it's, if the error is plus or minus you know, uh, zero, one, okay? Then that's your delta Z value, right? Because your Z can be higher by 0 0.1 or it could be lower by 0 0.1. So you could use this same exact formula to tell you what the error in the measured time of the, of the age of the universe is. So, you know, these formulas we've been talking about, I've been using them as a way to showcase the interpretation of the derivative. They certainly do that, but they do double duty to help you figure out you know, how one error in an independent variable may translate to an error in the dependent variable. So brief conclusions. Um, hopefully you've seen that calculus is not a collection of abstract symbols and concepts. It is widely applicable. I tried very hard to talk about all the different applications in uh, previous slides. And empowering, right? You can help it, uh, use it to help you understand maximum heart rate, to um, help you understand uh, what your body does during a cough. Um, second was, Calculus helps us better understand phenomena as diverse as the age of the universe, the inner workings of the human body, and derivatives in particular help us understand how these real world quantities change. So derivatives and change are things that are always connected. Uh, and then last one is just a main takeaway. You're surrounded by math um, and calculus is just the tip of the iceberg. If we had time to talk about topology and abstract algebra and geometry, you would see just as many applications and just as many um, cool stuff. So I want to thank you for uh, making it through this video, and hopefully this has been useful. Um, and I will see you in another video. Thank you.